And I will tell you a little bit about embedding methods in my group that we're developing, but I will try to give a little bit broader perspective. I also presented the tutorial, so when I was preparing this, I didn't know how specific or in specific I should become, so it may be like the worst of both worlds, I think. <laughs> all right, so first I would like to thank all my collaborators and students. So Sergei Iskakov, who is a postdoctoral fellow who has done a lot of work and calculations, and Chaman Ye, who was an excellent graduate student, also involved in these calculations, and theory and Runchi and Yambing, who have been two excellent students also involved, and Avijit, Pavel, and Emmanuel. All right, so, so see if one think about the systems and the degree of electron correlation that many of the quantum chemistry methods or you know, condensed matter methods would want to cover, right? And this is the increasing system size, and this is the degree of electron correlation. It is clear that Traditional quantum chemistry covered small, strongly correlated molecules, big, weakly correlated solids, right? DFT was indiscriminately used everywhere, also beyond these this green lines. But then there is this right area which is relatively uncovered, where I would say the intense method development happens and where we would want to go. It's maybe not multi-scale or so exascale, but definitely there are challenging problems here. All right, so this is the traditional area of Green's function, right, for weakly correlated problems, both weak and uh, big and small. So our task is somehow to access this area. So what we are doing, we are basically trying to develop this class of embedding methods. And in the embedding methods, we usually uh, rely on some kind of assumption that there is a region Right, for the scoop rate, that would be the d planes of copper that is the most important for the physical description of the system, and the rest can be described approximately. But because we are cutting out really like physical pieces of systems that actually communicate with environment and exchange with environment, the description is designed for open systems, right? So we want electrons to exchange between the environment and the system, so the system can have partial number of electrons, right? And uh, so this whole framework has to be designed for open system. The wave function has to be able to delocalize. And obviously, right, this is an area of intense development, as you also have heard Julia speaking this morning. All right. so. See, this is the telepathic connection, I think, between Julia and me. So you can use different things to perform embedding. You can use wave function, right? You can use density or Green's functions. And these methods based on wave function are density. They usually used to describe zero temperature properties, right? So they usually are to, fi to find ground state energy or lattice constant. But the Methods usually based on Green's function are really to access some kind of spectroscopic quantities like um, photoelectron spectrum, ARPES spectrum, some temperature dependent quantities, band gaps. Right? So one can also access all these things that the ground state methods are accessing, but they usually, you know, may or may not be evaluated. Right? So these are basically the major characteristics, and then Right in this ground state methods, there is a density matrix embedding theory, which was, which was done by Garnet Chan and then used by Laura Gagliardi, right? DFT types of embedding. Then here there is dynamical mean field theory embedding, uh, SET, which is the embedding that we are working on, or QDET, that is the Julia embedding. So you can see that you know, there is quite some telepathic connection here. I also relied that Julia will give good introduction, so I will skip some. So how do, what, does one make this calculation accurate? So see, one problem that in this embedding methods, right, if we cut these subspaces, one has to assume some kind of orbital representation. So one can you know, have different choices. One can do this in plane waves, LAPWs, right, like Gaussian orbitals. But nevertheless, one usually assumes that there is some sort of very good representation of at least few orbitals that one wants to embed. And then one has 
Another pillar that is necessary to reach high accuracy, and this is that one has to have some weakly correlated method that describes the whole system. Okay, and then what we require, for example, in, you know, from our embedding, that we have a finite temperature method. It has to be cheap enough, right, because we have to be able to illustrate solid. It has to be able to robustly converge to, you know, to few desired solutions, right? And we also need some kind of way of treating finite size effects if we want to treat solids. And that's, I would say, you know, is a actually high list of demands if one wants to do some correlated method on, on the environment. And then there is this sort of, I don't know if you can see, but then there is the embedding scheme, which we'll highlight later. But I will focus right now on this weakly correlated method for a little bit, because this is absolutely crucial to actually get a very good accuracy from this embedding method and, you know, to have accuracy comparable to what one would expect in quantum chemistry. This is why I told you that I will be speaking from more chemical point of view. So, right, so we're using Gaussian orbitals. I will talk about fully self-consistent finite temperature GW, which we use for this weakly correlated, uh, as this weakly correlated method, but obviously other choices are possible. All right, so, so see, we use basically fully self-consistent GW implemented in Gaussian orbitals. It is executed on Matsubara axis, which means that it is a finite temperature approach. We do full self-consistency to be thermodynamically consistent, and I will tell you in a second what does this mean and why we want to have this. So basically, we're evaluating all matrix of self-energy in the unit cell and outside. So that is, you know, many GW methods may, for example, only evaluate the diagonal parts of self-energy, and we have fully frequency-dependent self-energy. So we do this exclusively on imaginary axes. So we know where when executing the scheme have any analytical continuation. But at the end, if we want spectrum, we obviously have to analytically continue. So, so one part, right, we have fully full dependence of our self-energy on frequency, which means that we have to have a grid. So that's actually a, you know, a serious mathematical challenge because if one wants to have fairly low temperature and the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is wide, that would mean that we actually have to have in a Matsubara grid millions of points. So a lot of work in our group was actually spent on deriving this sort of good grids. So what we are using right now is intermediate representation, which is work of Shinaoka. It's actually a very good grid. And I would say that this is also, you know, what I decided to do, I decided to pinpoint to areas where I think mathematicians may be interested, actually, you know, getting some sort of good grids for performing the Fourier transforms on imaginary axis between imaginary time and the imaginary frequencies, uh, I think definitely a place where we could benefit from some help of, you know, some trained mathematicians. So you can see that with these grids, one can actually very well converge um, energy to like micro hard tree accuracy as a function of the grid size and so on. All right, so in our GW, we basically right, express the self energy as G times W, but in order to evaluate W, we use this uh, density fitted integrals, which we get from pi SCF. So in a regular GW, the evaluation of self energy would scale as O and to the sixth, while you know by using this density fitted integrals, we actually reduce this, whoops, I'm sorry, we reduce this to the fourth power as the, you know, as the number of orbitals in the unit cell goes. So you can think that this is, you know, like a very costly hard tree fog calculation, right? Because it's also executed on the grid. We have a sophisticated, I would say, relatively sophisticated parallelization scheme on GPU and so on. I will not talk about it, I'm not, but nevertheless, this has to be done, you know, in order to make it efficient, because in a finite temperature formalism, we, for example, cannot dispense with the virtual states, maybe only the very high lying, right? So you can see that this allows us to do systems like the manganese oxide on six by six by six grid, and it parallelizes well. And I told you why we want to do it fully self-consistently. This is because we want to evaluate this thermodynamic quantity, like, for example, free energy, right, or specific heat or entropy. If one 
evaluates them only, you know, like from first iteration or some subsequent iteration, but not fully consistently. Usually you have a difference if you evaluate this, for example, from galitsky migdal formula or from thermodynamic integration. So this full self-consistency removes this problem. So no matter how I evaluate the energy, I will arrive to the same solution. And this is, you know, you may think that it's pedantic, or, but I think it's actually necessary if we want sometimes to compare the free energies of these calculations. And I will show you such examples. All right, so we also worked on development of convergence accelerators. So we developed like DIIS procedure for this, uh, for this self-consistent GW. So we basically extrapolate as a function of Fock matrix, sigma, and uh, the density. And you can see that actually, see we have also kind of, you know, modified version of DIIS. And you can see that actually one can converge Right, as a, this, is the densi this is the difference in the density matrix between iteration, much, much faster than using like a simple dumping. So this also helps us. And that, you know, in this way for this finite temperature calculation, fully self-consistent GW, we can get to levels that we have 10 or more atoms in a unit cell, like between 10 and 15. So that allows us to do something like bismuth vanadate. And, you know, one of this GW iteration usually will finish in 20 minutes. So, so this is basically like, you know, our sort of base for doing the embedding on. We also did the relativistic version, so we can do the relativistic embedding and we use the two component approach, right? So this is like our minimum formalism to describe the spin orbit coupling that is necessary. The good thing about this two component approach is that maybe let me skip this because we'll then focus on the rest, is that we can have the full relativistic one-body Hamiltonian, where basically uh, this one-body Hamiltonian is the two-component right Hamiltonian, while the Coulomb integrals are basically the non-relativistic Coulomb integrals, so we can build the embedding on it very easily because we can just use this traditional right Hamiltonian and then have a two-component solver that solves the strongly correlated orbitals. So we again, you know, did this um, basically two-component fully self-consistent GW, and we use this right two-component approximation. We can check at the level of DFT how it scales if we compare to the full four-component. So you can see that this is basically the non-relativistic PBE. This is the relativistic PBE. You can see that this not occupied band got lower, right? And um, as the relativity was added, so this is our two component approximation. And you can see this is the full four components. So you can see that we exactly, right, recover at this level, this four component approach. So this is, right, just because we have four component DFT to compare but how it looks at the level of GW. So this is the non-relativistic GW. This is our two component finite temperature fully self-consistent GW. You can see again that there is a huge change in the gap as spin orbit coupling is added for this silver. This is a silver chloride, uh, silver the iodide which I'm showing. And you can see that spin orbit coupling, right, splits this basically this uh, bands over here. So this is like only our base, right? This weakly correlated theory which we need in order to do the embedding on top. So again, this, you know, we have an attachment to pi SCF and here we can do a little bit less, probably, you know, like maybe only 10 atoms in this relativistic approach because the matrices are bigger, but still one can have, you know, like a relatively complicated calculations. All right, so, so right now I will focus on, you know, on the embedding bit, right? So what do we want from the embedding? So we want basically this theory to be systematically improvable. One of our sort of demands is that we don't want to actually put very many orbitals in this embedded subspace. So we want to be able to choose like the smallest correlated bit that we want to embed. And that you can see as, you know, one of the things that 
probably you will, may see some differences between different people executing this embedding theories. Some people will want to put as many orbitals there as possible. But what I would want to do is that we want to only choose the orbitals that we believe are basically important for the description of the strong correlation. So we also want to get these quantities that are relevant for experiment from it, like, for example, the ARPES. So what I will show you is this self-energy embedding theory where we basically embed GW and thus the solver we use exact diagonalization. But let me talk about it so you will see what I mean. So as I told, other versions are also possible, right? One can do DFT plus DMFT or GW plus EDMFT. And I will also tell you a little bit about these differences. So, so see, in this Green's function embedding method, like from very high level view, what one wants to do, one wants to approximate some exact functional of Green's function. So in the same way as in DFT, right, there is exact functional of the density, we have this exact functional of Green's function, which, you know, presumably we know how to construct, but obviously that would be extremely expensive, right? So we also search for approximations. So one of the simplest approximation, which would be this embedding approximation, would be to assume that I have this full physical system and I could describe it at some sort of low level perturbative expansion method in terms of Green's function. I have some sort of tiny subsystem, which I will describe with higher level method. And, you know, one can imagine that this may be based on some sort of physically motivated separation into localized fragments. But one can also, you know, have different ways. So what I'm doing, right, I'm searching for an approximation to this exact Latinger word functional. And one can think that I can evaluate basically these pieces from some low-level method where I study the full problem, high-level method where I would only have a couple of orbitals, and I have this double counting when I'm subtracting what I evaluated at this low level. And see, this is like the very high-level description, so you will frequently hear this, but what actually is going on, right, that these pieces have to be then evaluated by each of these methods. And the differences between these different embedding schemes would be how these different pieces are in practice evaluated and connected and how what we call self-consistency is done. So I will try to explain some of this and, you know, how they relate to actual calculations. And see, since in this sort of high-level language, the self-energy is basically functional derivative of this Latinger word functional with respect to Green's function. The self-energy also fulfills, right, this additive scheme. And then again, the differences between different methods is, will be if they can actually be what is called phi derivable, if you have exactly fulfilled that this, you know, that this self-energy is really the functional derivative or not, or how you, how you subtract this double counting and so on. So the high level, so I made this comment that, you know, the embedding people have hard time to speak because the high level language is always the same kind of, you know, where these objects are said to exist and, you know, that somehow we approximate them. But at the low level, there is this whole sort of technical difficulty of actually evaluating these objects, and this is how they differ between these different theories. So in some way, you know, we sometimes speak this high level, but it's meaningless without this low level evaluation. Uh, so I had a quick question. Sure. So, uh, can you go back? Uh, so is the self-energy defined in, um, in terms of the first equation? Like, how, you do, how do you do that splitting for the self-energy? How do I do the splitting in terms of self-energy? Yeah, like, is it defined in, as based on the splitting you did for the uh, literature work question? So, it, so it's a little bit, I would say, this is a very good question. So in some theories, this would be one-to-one -one because you could say that, you know, like when you take the functional derivative of the functional, basically with respect to Green's function, right, like the full Green's function, the Green's function only for the subset and double counting, this will fall in this way. But in between these theories and how they differ, this not necessarily is true because not all of them will be what 
you know, this Green's function people call phi derivable. So actually, I would say treat this as some sort of motivational equation because it doesn't always happen that this really is so. All right, so, so see, in this embedding methods, right, the idea is that you have this system that is too big and too correlated to calculate brute force. And, uh, you know, you can split it in terms of some kind of physical orbitals that you're going to, for example, I don't know, take out the orbitals and treat them at high level method and all the other orbitals at some low level method. But you can also be much more general and say, you know, I'm going to treat all the weakly correlated orbitals by some perturbative methods, right? And what I will define as strongly correlated orbitals by some more exact non-perturbative method. So, right, in this embedding, this separates onto this series of manageable calculation where we have to have this weakly correlated method for the full problem. So I would say in most cases, this would be the most expensive calculation. So like our... GW is probably much more expensive than any other calculation that we do in this process. And uh, right, that provides the approximation. And again, approximation to this total weakly correlated functional. Right? And then there are this what we call impurity problem, where a couple of the strongly correlated orbitals is embedded in some kind of non-interacting buff that basically describes the interaction of the strongly correlated orbital with the rest of the problem, right? So what I told you that this is to model open systems. So in the strongly correlated orbitals, I can have, you know, two and a half electrons, right? Because this half is traveling between my environment, right? And this sort of strongly correlated orbital. So this is why I have to have this buff, right? And they are described by this, or approximated by this functional that I have for this strongly correlated right orbitals. So what is also important, right, what I was alluding this morning, that see, this is an auxiliary system. This is not a physical system in embedding method like uh, SET or DMFT. It's basically an auxiliary system of the strongly correlated orbital embedded in this non-interacting buff which is only meant to illustrate the strongly correlated orbital and the effect of environment on them. It has no explicit or no direct relationship to, you know, to this full problem that you started. Of course, you know, like we want to have some sort of, you know, it's not completely different, right? Or it's, but in principle, like from the solution of the impurity, we cannot really say that much about, you know, about our full problem. So we still have to combine all these things to have the solution for the full problem. So these are molecular like you can think if we have a finite buff formulation. All right, so one can have different types of this functional. One of the you know, simplest functional is basically like, a fun like approximation to a functional like I wrote that you have this total weakly correlated functional for all orbitals, right, and then many blocks of the strongly correlated orbital. Orbitals, we call this functional set split. But one can also, you know, generalize this and treat an orbital within many impurities. So basically, the same orbital can be in, you know, one impurity and then counted again in another. It requires more sophisticated way of um, subtracting the double counting. But you can basically do something like many body expansion of self energy in an embedding field. So then basically you have this parent functional, right? And then you have a functional for this overlapping orbitals minus double counting and so on. So one can design methods, you know, which are looking more like a method of increments, for example, but way based on self energy. All right, so then again, in this functional approaches, you can have what is called phi or psi functional, and only, you know, only looking from this high level. So this phi functional is a functional of G, right, so Green's function, and bear interactions. So this is the, and there is also psi functional, which is a function of G, right, Green's function, but screened interactions. 
So see this very interaction functional is used in DFT and uh, DM, DFT plus DMFT or like uh, in set. So where I approximate this object, right? But in, for example, GW plus EDMFT, people use really this functional in terms of screen interactions. So one can again, right, like formally, if you see all these functional equations will be written in the same way, the objects will depend on basically different quantities and the evaluation of these quantities will differ significantly. All right, so just to, you know, kind of allude to how different all the schemes can work and how differently this is evaluated in practice. So see, there are many choices, right, how people can choose the impurity orbitals and how they can treat these different parts of self-energy. So basically, in each of this approach, what happens, you have the full orbital space, right, and then you have something what you have chosen as your strongly correlated orbital. So right now, there will be some kind of interactions, right, between, this weak, between what you treat as weakly correlated and the strongly correlated orbitals. So what we call usually these interactions, we call them non-local, right, because they couple both of these blocks, and they modify your original self-energy of these orbitals. So basically, you know, for, this is what physicists call screening, right, so basically, the presence of this non-local self-energy modifies the total value of self-energy for these chosen orbitals. So see, in a method, for example, like uh, SET, what happens is that this on-site self-energy with bare Coulomb interaction is explicitly modified by this non-local part of self-energy coming from all the other orbitals. So what it means that I have to keep all these other orbitals in my calculation, okay? Then in GW plus EDMFT, what happens is they usually see what they say. They say that they basically will evaluate their strongly correlated self-energy for these orbitals of choice as the function of screened interactions, but right, the screened interactions are evaluated as if all these other orbitals were not explicitly treated. So basically, see, this quantity here is, like, if you really summed up these two quantities, they would more or less add, you know, to what is here, okay? So the, the screening from all these other orbitals, right, here is illustrated by this presence of the screened interaction, here is illustrated by two pieces of self-energy which are treated separately. So this is, I'm putting it here because basically there will be some residual double counting that has to be taken. Then there are these methods like, for example, CG0W0 plus full cell DMFT, which is like what recently Garnet did. And then what you did do, you have a huge orbital space, okay? So not couple of orbitals, not just D orbitals, you have the full cell. And you evaluating your self-energy for this full cell, uh, cell with basically bare interactions, and you count that this term is so huge that basically you can neglect this non-local part. Okay, so I'm putting the sigma small non-local weak because we would assume that this is so small that can be neglected. So, sorry, can I yeah? ask you that? So what, what are, what's the basis for that assumption? Um, for this assumption here? Yeah. Um, in my opinion, not clear. Okay. So I, I think it works for insulator where the, or for systems where this term is small. If this, and because, you know, you have so many orbitals, if, if he tried this with a very tiny number of orbitals, <coughs> this term is large, like here, and it will break down. Also, it's kind of a little bit empirical, right? There is no proof. Yeah, if it works, it works. <clears throat> if it doesn't, I think it doesn't here. Okay. Like, I don't want to, you know, I haven't run this. I didn't try th this approach. I didn't check it. In my opinion, this neglection is severe, but it's not my work, so I can... Oh, no, I know. I wanted to know your opinion. So... Just to, you know, express, like, 
See, so we talked about this high level functionals and everything at this level looks the same, kind of the same. But how actually, what are the differences on the ground, okay, when actually one executes this? So see, this is how the Green's function of a, in the K space for a crystal is written, right? So I have basically omega Fock matrix in the K space, right, minus the self-energy of the impurity, which will be the self-energy of the chosen orbitals, right, the self-energy of GW minus the double counting. So that would be my self-energy in the K space. And in all these methods, the embedding happens in the real space. So there would be differences how we do the embedding in the real space. So, so see, because, right, so in GW plus DMFT or set, what will happen, right, we have basically this, like the single orbital or, you know, some sort of orbital subspace that we choose that is coupled to this non-interacting buff which will illustrate for us the rest of the system, right? All this thing that we treat as environment. So, so this, right, this sort of the rest is described as this hybridization. So in the real space, how in the MFT this will look like, we'll have Fock matrix truncated to, you know, to this. So this would be our local Green's function, let's say for the couple of embedded orbitals. This will be the Fock matrix truncated to the, right, to this couple of embedded orbitals, or you can think to the unit cell. There will be this self-energy from the strongly correlated orbitals, and this will be coupled to this embedding frequency dependent field, which couples to the rest of environment, okay? So, again, you can see that the embedding condition is such that that the self-energy for this chosen orbital has to come entirely from the impurity construction here, okay? The self-energy has to be entirely gotten out of the impurity in the DMFT. So this is, right, this delta is this hybridization. So what we have is that this local Green's function for this couple of orbitals or, you know, unit cell has to be equal to the impurity Green's function. So this is very important. And in a second, you will see why. So in order to enforce this equality, I have to evaluate the self-energy, which has to implicitly recover all these non-local interactions. So the only way I can do it is by modifying my Coulombing interaction, which are for the single orbital, right, to the screened interactions. And then the sigma impurity DMFT will implicitly recover my on-site self-energy plus this non-local interactions for the rest. All right, so what we do in self-energy embedding theory? So see, the k-space construction is exactly the same, right? Because it's just k-space Green's function, and there is nothing mysterious about that. So in the real space, the embedding condition looks a little bit different. So see, we have this, right, this local part of Green's function in the real space, the local part of Fock matrix, I have the impurity self-energy, right, which I class this non-local term, taken explicitly, minus the delta set. So, see, right now I'm keeping this term explicitly, okay? I'm not going to do anything, I'm just going to plug it in there, it will come from GW. So, my hybridization is then defined slightly differently, right? Because I, like you remember that, that this part was one single self-energy previously, which was the self-energy of the impurity. So right now in the self-energy embedding theory, I have a propagator, which is auxiliary propagator in comparison to DMFT, which only deals with the impurity. And I have this, right, I have this non-local part of self-energy, which I'm keeping explicitly. So see, this auxiliary propagator is just, right, having this self-energy and this hybridization. And this part comes explicitly. So, right, so this is my embedding condition in SEET. This is the embedding condition in DMFT. So you can see that this part is explicitly kept. What that means for self-energy, right, that my self-energy, which is this local self-energy, will be the sum of these two terms, 
this term I will evaluate with Bercoulomb interactions, but it's always modified explicitly by the presence of this non-local interactions coming from GW. So in fact, this total local term is screened, even though this part comes from the Bercoulomb interactions. In DMFT, right, this local part has to be equal to the impurity self-energy, so it means that here I must have the screened interaction in order to recover this full bit, because it implicitly has to also recover the magnitude of this non-local GW contribution. So, right, so this is why DMFT uses screened impurity interactions and why we use the bare Coulomb interactions, because we always modify the self-energy in this way. Mm -hmm. so with this subtraction, is that possible that the resulting sigma SEET becomes unphysical? So this part... Yeah, with the subtraction. Right? Uh, this part, yes, it can be uh, non-causal. Yeah. This part is always causal, okay. and the total part it will come out causal if everything is done right, or I have never seen it actually being non-causal. But there's uh, no reason to think there is a proof saying there is no reason that there is a proof. But see, here, so, all prepared for that. So, just one second, one second. It will come in the next slide. But right now, see, here you have to take the screened interaction, okay? So, why, why I would say, like, why do we want to take bare interactions versus screened interactions? So, the, the most uh, basic thing would be that you want, basically, the, you know, the chemists like better interactions, one can say, but this is actually not the reason. The reason is that technically, if you go from this high level to low level, there has to be a solver that will give this part or this part. It, actually, the solvers that are able to take fully frequency dependent um, two body interactions are very few and um, they have a lot of problems. So technically, it's better to operate with a solver that can take uh, bare interactions, but if somebody, you know, had a marvelous solver with screened interactions, I would say that I don't see a reason why, you know, one would want to do one or the other, truly. Okay? Yeah? yeah. In the, the, the two equations that you wrote define them all. Is that the same in the, the self-energy self The two yeah. equations that I wrote defines? Like these two equations uh, for DMFT that you wrote, mm -hmm. it defines the DMFT approximation. Yeah. Uh, is it the same with your, your self energy and the Yes, theory? so I would say like this equation plus this equation and the equation in the K space, right, would define my full self consistency and what I do or this self energy approximation. Yeah. Okay. I also have to have this auxiliary propagator, right, for evaluation of this thing. So one more, I would say, equation, maybe. Okay. So the screened interaction, see, so this is like a H2 molecule that is evaluated at the level of GW plus DMFT by Christian Haule. It's actually a beautiful example of the danger of screened interactions. So the screened interaction have to be gotten from somewhere, right? So, so if, so the kind of what is good, maybe let me come back here, that if a Merlin gave us true exact screened interaction, this part would become exact. And of course, a method like a CET would lose because I would still have this GW part and, you know, this part which I evaluated by some kind of solver. So if a Merlin gave me this exact interaction, this would be the way to do. The problem is that the Merlin can be wrong. Okay, so if I, for example, take the screened interaction evaluated at the GW level, in the limit of strong correlation, like where this H2 is stretched, the screened interactions are wrong. So you can see that this method like GW plus DMFT, here, like if you look at this, so this, you know, there are many levels because there are different double countings and all sorts of mac here. But nevertheless, you see that all this GW plus DMFT lines and here, because at 3.6, the strong correlation kicks in, they are not able to get the good screened interactions anymore. Okay, so the presence of these bare interactions saved the day in such cases. Okay, so, but if uh, in here, right, in the equilibrium regime, they can be 
probably better because maybe the screened interactions, you know, then allow me to recover this term at a higher level. So there is like a different, I would say, approach to, you know, to this madness a little. All right, so also what happens indirectly with hybridization, see the hybridization in the MFT, you could think that it also contains in some implicit way this non-local part of GW. That's like another viewing of that, that, you know, that basically what we do in SEET is also leading to a modification of hybridization, really. So if you compare these two approaches, they actually, you know, will have different magnitude of hybridization, but coming back to lean question, can it get non-physical? So see this part can get non-causal, but uh, in uh, what it will cause in the MFT is that the hybridization will become non-causal. In set, the hybridization will never become non-causal, but this term can be non-causal, okay? But I did not ever see that the total self-energy got non-causal, because, right, like, if the total, for example, GW self-energy is causal, then it's really a sum of non-causal term plus the, right, the, the on-site term. So what that means, that in self-energy embedding, also this, you know, this delta has a little bit different physical meaning than in the MFT, right? And that self-energy embedding would also really result in a different diagrammatic series than the MFT. All right, so how do we do, you know, how the troops on the ground perform the self co Yes? I had something. How the troops on the ground perform the self-consistency, okay? So we evaluate, right, this uh, GGW for the full crystal. Then we usually choose some sort of subset of strongly correlated orbital. It may be, for example, the D orbitals. We solve this embedding problem, right, in the D orbitals where we have this non-interacting buff coupled to a couple of these orbitals. We set up the self-energy as a some of the strongly correlated bit and this weakly correlated, right, self-energy, and we keep iterating. Mostly to update the hybridization, but also to update the full G of the full crystal. All right, so how, you know, how does it work on something like molecular systems? So see, this is, for example, we took part in the Simons collaboration benchmark, so these are the results for atom and transition metal molecules. This is very basic, but it allows you to estimate what kind of accuracy you can expect. And this definitely also proves that the chosen orbitals, you know, have to communicate with environment. So this pink line is the chemical accuracy line. And you can see this is the heat buff CI, for example, the mm, CCSDT, the golden standard, right? The auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo, and here you have the self-energy embedding theory. So one can really get very accurate results actually for chemical systems with this approach. So how this compares to, you know, to something like NFPT2 or CASPT2. So, right, in NFPT2 or CASPT2, you have to have all the orbitals that are strongly correlated in the active space. Here can be, they can be split among multiple impurities. We have never observed any divergences due to diverging denominators because we don't have really denominators, you know, as such when we do this imaginary time uh, type of propagation. We can choose these orbitals in such a way that, you know, because we run either GF2 or GW, we know which orbitals are strongly correlated and this embedding only requires one body Green's function where sometimes, you know, some version of NEF and CAS even can require up to four body density matrix. So let me show you some examples for solids. Okay, I have a few minutes. All right, so this is the strontium manganate. This is like a component of ceramic. And this is, you know, we chosen this because we know that it has this paramagnetic insulating fails, uh, phase that fails in DFT, but it also fails in GW plus EDMFT. Okay, so this is what we would try to describe with uh, SET. So basically, this is C, this is G0, W0, and uh, DFT. So you can see that there are lines crossing the Fermi level. This is a metallic system at the level of G0, W0. And uh, 
It's also metallic at the level of GW plus EDMFT. And I would say that I would infer that it's metallic because the screened interactions are wrong, which are put to the impurity. So you can see that, right, this is a metal. So the question is, you know, can we figure out what is the origin of this metallic peak if, if the face is insulating and if you can do any better? So see, this is what the fully self-consistent GW does, or G0W0 would do the same. So we do this GTH, DZVP basis, right, with GTH pseudo-potential. We do the paramagnetic phase. We do the 1,000 Kelvin, because this is where the paramagnetic phase exists, and this is 6 by 6 by 6 crystal lattice. And the dashed line are the experiment. The solid line are the GW. So you can see that due to the manganese T2G, there is this non-zero density of states, which happens smack right in the gap. So basically, right, this is the reason why GW doesn't work here. So see, since this means that our starting orbitals are terrible, right? So what we do, we actually don't do the fully self-consistent GW to start, but we do one shot. We then solve these impurity problems and the embedding and then do another shot of GW. So basically, we want the orbitals to slowly modify as we do the embedding. And you can see that if we are on the iteration 23, the band gap is still, you know, non-zero. But once we iterate more, right, the band gap opens. So the, really, the orbitals adjust, and you know, we see that the total energy, the correlation energy converges, and chemical potential. And we can also you know, do different impurities. We can embed manganese T2G and manganese EG, right, and oxygen P pi, depending on the schemes. But when we really add all the density of states, you can see that we can resolve the peaks quite well. Independent of, you know, what impurities we study, we can see that the peaks next to the gap are from manganese T2G and oxygen P pi, and basically manganese EG and uh, manganese T2G and oxygen, uh, again, P pi, right? And the band gap opens. So we can also see the occupation number in the real space in the cell. I'm plotting only the ones that, you know, are significantly different from zero and two, and you can see that Basically, GW almost gave us doubly occupied orbitals and then empty, right? But when we run the embedding, there is this sort of partially occupied T2G, which appears, which really is strongly correlated. All right, so, so basically, right, it, one can if one doesn't have this, and this is done with bare interactions, right? So basically, we avoided this wrong GW screened interaction starting point here. All right, so as the last bit, I will take this one minute, I will show you the bismuth vanadate, which is basically perovskite in a diamond anvil. So this is a perovskite synthesized under pressure by Dana Friedman, and what she... The, this is interesting because this is one of the last antiferromagnetic perovskite that wasn't synthesized, but the prediction by good enough says that this antiferromagnetic perovskite, but still metallic, which is very, very, you know, infrequent because normally if something is uh, antiferromagnetic, it's insulating. So all what they have is the DFT prediction, and we try to see if the DFT is right. So see, this is where basically pressure versus the unit size, size curve. And of course, if this has to get insulating, right, this is at the lowest pressure, so we're going to study the lowest pressure. So there are two phases. There is A phase, so see all the electrons in one layer up, the other layer down, and here they basically in this diagonals in the C phase. So in the A phase, you can see that the DFT gives metallic state in this lowest pressure. We do the GW, it actually recovers the DFT very nicely. We do the self-energy embedding, recovers the DFT again, so nothing happening here. The DFT prediction was right. We do the C phase, and you can see again the C phase is predicted to be metallic, but when we run GW, the GW predicts something what is more like a semi-metal, and again, set confirms this, you know, semi-metallic character at this lowest pressure. So definitely the here, the DFT prediction, right, 
was qualitatively right that it was a metal, but it's a metal of a very different character because it's much more of a semi-metal. So right now we can check that basically the semi-metal is created because the bismuth Px and Py and the vanadium Dx uh, Dyc, but they didn't depressurize fully to the ambient pressure. So we did, you know, computational study where we did depressurize, and what you can see that in the C phase nothing happened, uh, like when we, you know, made the unit cell slightly bigger and depressurized, so the C phase stays the same, but in the A phase. See, this is the DFT, and you can see that GW still gives metallic, but after we actually do the embedding, you can see that there is a tiny band gap developing, okay? So most likely, you know, this band gap is tiny. Probably at high temperature, it still will behave metallic, right? We artificially kind of, we lower the temperature as much as we can in this finite temperature approach. But nevertheless, what is the lesson here, right? That the DFT predicted either this character wrongly, or, you know, a wrong type of metal. All right, so what did I tell you today? I told you that basically there are these different embedding schemes and that decent solutions can be obtained, right? That what is important is that one has this sort of low-lying methods which are for weak correlation, but sometimes one needs to include temperature Right? What I didn't tell you is that actually in order to get the spectra, we analytically continue, but I think that we have it under some controlled, right? And one can also do the relativistic embedding. So thank you once more for listening and thank you for inviting me.